and welcome to Patriots, excuse me, not quite Patriots, Lament. This is the Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. It's our newest show, which we are beginning today, right now, even as we speak. Brought to you by Far North Tactical, right over at the corner of 8th and Lacey. If you are looking for a way to defend yourself, your property, your family, head on over there to Far North Tactical. You'll find everything from firearms to body armor. To, of course, survival foods, even medical gear. Check it out for yourself. Far North Tactical at 8th and Lacey, bringing you this hour of programming right here on KFAR. We've had a, a number of changes to the website. I want to go over real quickly here as folks are settling in so they can tell their friends on Facebook or wherever else how you can listen online. Go to our website, kfar660.com, and it'll pull up the Last Frontier Media Active Station page. Now that will also that gives you the access to all of our different stations. If you head over there to that tab at the top of the page, there it says stations. Put your cursor on top, and you'll see all five of our stations pop out underneath: KFAR, X Rock, K Wolf, Ted FM, and Sports. If you move your cursor down over the KFAR tab, you'll see the uh, four other tabs pop out to the right: Audio Archives, Personalities, Joe Nava, and Chat. Obviously, if you scroll down to the Chat tab. That will give you the opportunity to join us in the chat room, where I am already. If you want to listen on live at the very top of the page, you see there it says Listen Live. Just select a station from the top, click on the KFAR logo, and it will open up a window for you to be able to listen online. Hopefully that was clear enough. Do you think I did okay with that, Josh? Yeah, pretty good. All right, joining me in the studio this morning, uh, the uh, one of the sponsors, of course, uh, Aaron Bennett, is actually working today, so he can't be here this morning, but his brother, <laughs> yeah. Josh Bennett... Uh, from Bighorn Enterprises, it's here, and uh, so is Dave Giesel from the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty. Speaking of which, I'm going to start with Dave. Uh, some big news for Ron Paul supporters today. Yeah, Ron Paul is going to be... Hang on a second. Let me make sure I've got your microphone on. There you He's go. going to be uh, in town in Fairbanks tomorrow, for anybody who doesn't know. It's going to be at the Westmark at uh, 1 p.m. So That's, that's the, the seats... Westmark right there in downtown Fairbanks at 10th and, uh, I believe, Noble? Yep, yep, right near uh, Far North Tactical. Bang. So go to Far North Tactical, and then you'll find your way from there. Um, <laughs> and that's 1 o'clock Sunday afternoon, downtown Fairbanks. Yep, and there's 800 seats, and so it would be really cool to just uh, totally pack the place out and have a bunch more people even than that. And surround the building. <laughs> well, uh, now, come on now. We're not going to want to surround the building. That's going to make people think that... People in Fairbanks are fanatical. I about meant Ron because there's so many people uh, there that they're surrounding the building. I didn't mean like the wall at Jericho. Oh, okay, all right. No, and, just walk, walk around the building seven times. All right. Well, uh, gentlemen, obviously this show is going to be kind of a, uh, a takeoff on what we began uh, back in May with Patriots Lament uh, in terms of talking about liberty issues and talking about what is uh, going on with our personal liberties and what we can do to not only defend our own rights and our own property and our own family, but what we can do to help others as well in that same fight. Yeah. So where do we go this morning? Well, we're going to, since I made Aaron go to work, and uh, so I could control the show. (laughs) Is that what that is? Yeah. We're going to uh, basically just open it up for at least this hour, possibly the next for Ron Paul. Um. Basically give our opinions of why we like Ron Paul and prefer him over everyone, even every congressman, every senator, pretty much almost every person we prefer him. <laughs> and it's kind of an odd thing because we come on here a lot and talk about not participating, not voting, things like that, which is great. And I still believe... Um, not being a Republican, I have made my own little personal decision to register as a Republican here on the 6th. Tuesday? Yes, Super for, Tuesday. For the, for the yeah. caucus? And only to show my support for Ron Paul. Um, hypocritical, yeah, I don't care. I just basically see him as the... Ron Paul's the Trojan horse of the Republican Party, and I'm going to help push that horse right in there. And if he's not there, you know what? I'm done. I'm gone anyway. So it doesn't really affect me at all. I mean, if he's not on a ticket, I don't care. I'm not going to support anybody else. I mean, 
I think supporting anyone else is hypocritical, especially if you supposedly, if you supposedly believe in the beginnings of this so-called republic, if you supposedly believe in the Constitution and think that it is the law, then you can't support anybody else. You cannot. You may, but you cannot support anybody else and keep that so same you, line of reasoning. Yeah, you just can't be consistent. You you can do whatever you want, True. <laughs> but everybody will know you're lying is the thing. Right. Well, well how, how does that differentiate from any other politician ever, though? I mean, it, it, Well, we're not talking about the politician. We're talking about the supporters. Of course, politicians lie. That's what they do best. Right. All right. We've already got a, a phone call coming in here this morning on the hotline. Uh, would you like to take the... Uh, yeah. All right. Let's go to the hotline. Good morning, caller, and welcome to the program. Who am I talking Hi. to? This is Josh. All right, Josh. Good morning. Are we, you're calling in from another state, aren't you? I am not. So this is different, Josh. Oh, what? different. All right. Go ahead, Josh. A lot of Joshes um, out there. We need to prune them out. I was calling in because I felt like Josh was uh, being a little hard on himself because I uh, felt like he was making an exception for Ron Paul, but... My personal opinion on the whole Ron Paul thing, especially since I share most of the same views that Josh does, I'm not a big on voting, um, philosophically typically, but one thing that's really different from Ron Paul from every other candidate pretty much ever is he's promising not to do stuff. If you elect me and put me in this position with all these powers, I'm not going to use most of them. You know, I think he'd be better personally, but uh, I mean, I don't think there's ever been a candidate who's basically running on a campaign of not messing with you, like this whole thing. Completely and honestly, so I think that differentiates him from all other, all other candidates. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, he also has actually some credibility when he says he's not going to do stuff. Like he has, you know, thirty or forty years of being in the house voting against stuff all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that is the biggest. That's a really good point. It's his consistency. If he says that, you can believe it. Mm-hmm. Every other candidate, you can use, you know, go on Google and YouTube and find videos of him contradicting himself. But, Ron Paul's been saying the same thing since before I was born, so it's uh, hard nice. to not believe him. You know, that's an interesting point that you make, because I actually I was doing a little research uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I decided to go back and look at some of Ron Paul's speeches that have been put online going back to, I mean, these are obviously archived footage because they, they didn't have the Internet until Al Gore created it. And <laughs> What year did he claim to do? Anyway, uh, and I digress. The, the point is I went back and I, and I saw some speeches that he was giving in the 1980s that are almost exactly word for word the same speeches he's giving now. So I think that you, you do have a point there about his consistency. Here, it's something that, that bothers me about uh, the, the support that I see people giving Ron Paul, and I, and I, I address this to you too, Josh, in terms oh. of your, your, and both of you, both Joshes, uh, your, your willingness to uh, become a part of the Republican machinations and uh, to, to sign on, to become part of a party in order to support one man. Uh, how does that differentiate for somebody who says, hey, hail Caesar, Let's put our trust in one man. Let's give that, that let us make sure that this one person is going to be the savior of the republic. I, I to me there there's danger in that, and I and red flags and bells and whistles are going off in my head. Yeah, you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, typically you, you you sign off on a candidate because he promises to do what Republicans do. Uh, the whole vote, the whole party thing makes it easier to vote. So you don't have to research a person. Parties, you know, they say we're going to do this and this. So every Republican typically does that, and there's minor differences, but parties are time saver. Ron Paul's kind of not doing that at all. Ron Paul is Ron Paul, he does what Ron Paul does, and um, and if he, was just, if he was just some random guy saying all this stuff, it'd be hard to believe him, but the fact is he's been saying it for 30 or 40 years, you know, and it makes it way easier to uh, to trust him. If it was Rick Santorum and every single thing that Ron Paul was saying, I wouldn't buy it at all, but <laughs> totally it's Ron Paul. Yeah. I think also it's not necessarily that we're supporting... I mean, you say Ron Paul. You're supporting Ron Paul. You think this guy's going to save the republic. No, I don't at all. But we support his ideals. This is the only guy out there that you can look at and say, wow, I support that. He's the only one out there in the public scene, for the most part, I mean, in the position that he is in, that is standing up for liberty. And he pretty much believes just like I do. I mean... There's probably some differences we have. I haven't sat down and had a conversation with him, but his public speeches, what he says publicly and what he's stood for in his personal and public life, it's what we stand for, too. So that's what we're supporting an ideal, the ideal of liberty more than just 
the man, Ron Paul, or am I wrong? Yeah, well, he's the only guy who uh, advocates things on a philosophical basis. So somebody says, you know, what about the war on drugs or something like that? And he doesn't talk about all the laws and minutia. He says, well, philosophically, you know, let's talk about the basis of this. Is it right to tell people what they can and can't do with their bodies? Right? Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, if you're going to regulate drugs, why can't you regulate guns? And people are like, oh, don't regulate guns. I like guns, but I don't like drugs. You should regulate those. And he's like, well, let's be philosophically consistent. Right? And... Um, and that's what, kind of what sets him apart. You say, you know, not just supporting Ron Paul, the guy, but what he advocates. And he actually advocates a philosophy instead of a bunch of totally disconnected, philosophically contradictory issues like everybody else. That, that's OK. I'm, I'm still not entirely convinced. And, and forgive me for, for my skepticism here, but I've been burned in the past. OK, I, I've, I've had, uh, a, you know, I've gotten whipped into a frenzy over a particular candidate. And have gotten, you know, very involved in politics, only to find that candidate eventually falling flat because, oh, gee, they're they're human beings. I mean, every single person who runs for office, I I, I don't think we've yet had Jesus Christ. Well, that's because you were but, pulling for Joe Miller. Okay, no. uh, I told no. you way early that that was a big mistake. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not I'm not saying any 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 specific candidate because I have not I mean I'm talking about all the way back to the 1990s when I was a young man in college and getting active in in politics back in Arizona where I, where I went to school and then when I was in the military uh, being completely and totally let down by the Republican Party to the point where I have not yet I mean here 20 almost 20 years later I've not yet been wooed back and to see some of my friends saying that they're willing to become a Republican just in order to support a particular candidate, it, it just it kind of makes me, uh, to be quite honest, it makes me a little sick. I, I just, I mean, when I when I heard you say yesterday, Josh, then Josh Bennett here, mm -hmm. I, when I heard you say yesterday that you were going to become a Republican, just I, I threw up a little bit in my mouth. I really did. Well, I'm going to throw you out the window here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but have you heard of the blue blue Republicans movement? thing on Facebook that started, and it got big on Huffington Post, where there's a guy who's going around trying to convince Democrats to register for, uh, as Republicans for Ron Paul. And honestly, he's so not Republican in many ways that he could easily be a Democrat. I mean, I could honestly visualize him running as a Democrat in some ways. He could be a blue dog or a, a kind of a, I don't know, but a fiscally conservative Democrat or something. But some of his policies are so liberal. I mean, he's, he's more liberal, quote unquote, than Democrats on drugs and war and so many things that are such a big deal that if he was a Democrat, I'd still vote for him. If he was Green Party, I'd still vote for him because that's not, you know, if you're voting for a man, you're voting for the man and not the party. I mean, so the party is just some silly ritual we have to do, but I don't know, that really wraps up in the whole party thing. I don't really care. It's not part of my identity, but Plus I don't think it's part of his either. There's other states, too, where they allow you to vote. I mean, they're not closed primaries i think mm -hmm. and yeah. i mean this is just something that the well, republicans have forced down our throat basically well if you want to join our little game you got to vote register as republican well guess what i'm going to unregister the next day i might even do it the same hour i don't know <laughs> all right thanks for the call josh four five eight talk is the number we're going to move on to the next caller here good morning who's this this is mike mike what's on your mind today oh i got a couple things here uh on what you said, Steve, I mean, the thing about Ron Paul, it's not just that he's the candidate, it's, it, it's not just about him, it's about a movement that's going on in this country. So, I mean, we got to do what we got to do to keep the movement going. And uh, first I'm going to say that if 800 people show up tomorrow, but uh, if only 100, 100 of them are registered as Republicans, they're not going to be able to do Ron Paul any good on Tuesday. So tomorrow, tomorrow uh, we're going to have about five voter registrars there, and people can uh, actually switch their registration tomorrow instead of waiting till Tuesday. They can also do it on Tuesday, but uh, they can also do it tomorrow. So I urge people, if there's 800 people, they need, they need to all be registered as Republicans to be able to vote for Ron Paul on Tuesday and have an impact. So my other question, though, on uh, do you guys think that Ron Paul would end the TSA? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, boy, I don't know. If it, it would be I, he he can't put forth as the president. He can't put forth legislation, right? And the that only way he could do it is if if he did it by executive order, in which he's pledged not to right. do. Right, but now, however, he's actually pledged to um, repeal the executive orders that are on the books, right? 
And so I don't know if there's aspects of TSA, which is authorized through uh, the Patriot Act and numerous other things, that rest on executive order. Because if, if, if executive order powers went away, a lot of those laws would have no enforceability anymore. Is it the TSA not under the executive branch? Was it, it was brought know. into existence by Congress? Yes. It was. So, um, yeah, so it would still take Congress actually introducing some sort of bill to repeal TSA. Like, the president doesn't actually do a lot of the things that people think the president does. O- Obama <laughs> did not write the, you know, the so-called Obamacare bill. It has to be introduced in the House and officially authored by, you know, a House member, which it was really written by, you know, Acorn. lobbyists. Wasn't it Acorn or somebody? That wrote, I mean, they, they, when, uh, when, you, no, have, it, it when in, you have the vast majority Thomas. of uh, congressmen saying that they didn't even read the bill. Yeah, that, but, that, again, that, that one I didn't just throw up in my mouth. I mean, no, I spewed. But the process, that. though, if we're you know talking about what Ron Paul is going to dismantle, um, he really can't. He can veto stuff and he can sign stuff, and so it's still up to the House and Senate to uh, to actually uh, move things forward in that regard. The one thing he can do is departments. Um, departments and uh, executive orders. And yeah. and for some reason, you know, since all of our wars are undeclared, they fall right under the executive. And so he could uh, end all the wars. And then Congress would actually have to declare war and get a uh, – they would have to have a two-thirds majority to override a presidential veto or whatever because I don't think he would authorize it if yeah. they wanted to go. All right. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. 458-TALK is a number. Welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's this? Good morning. This is Mark. Mark, what's on your mind? Well – Gentlemen, I'd really like to be able to vote for somebody like we did with Miller. And, but I don't have an R or a D behind my name. I have an O on my registration. Uh, I don't see what good it's going to do to uh, elect a very good captain to a ship of state that's run hard aground upon the rocks and taken on water. Here, here. That's well said. Point. Well yeah, said. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you on that. I myself yeah. will not be... Uh, participating but yeah yeah that's a really good point. all right now, now mark let me ask you this have you got on a kind of a, a sidebar here do you are you in the lifeboat already do you have uh do you have a way off this sinking ship well we'll never get out of this world alive but uh <laughs> i do have my uh skills knowledge and tools yeah that's that's it right there all right Good to go. You know, Mark, uh, before I let you go, one more question here in terms of uh, the political process in general. Have you completely abandoned it as an idea, or or do you think it's something that we've been snookered into in the first place? Uh, we were bought and paid for the Tennessee plan out of the United Nations, gentlemen. That's my estimation. Bought and paid for? I'm not sure I... With the Tennessee plan, when they uh, established the state, it was uh, done out of a think tank out of the U.N., Thanks to the boys up in uh, yes, the, uh, the state const- Alaska state constitution and Hawaii, oh, yeah. uh, you know. Hawaii very similar. Yeah, yeah. correct. Yep. Yeah, the different fundamentally different type of state uh, constitution mm-hmm. than the other 48 states. And that's why we have such a socialist constitution where it calls for like the collective ownership of the resources. Yeah, that's why correct. the federal and state uh, agencies own you know 90 whatever percent of the state. Bob and then, the and then, the, and then the rest of it we rent from them anyway. <laughs> exactly. Hey, Mark, thanks very much. You've given me some food for thought this morning. 458-TALK is the number. This is the Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's on my phone? Hey, Steve, this is Claudio. Claudio, good morning. What's on your mind? Hey, uh, i got a question for you guys. Uh, I heard that Ron Paul wants to return all the lands, all the government lands to the states by the eliminate the Department of Interior. Is that uh, something true? And the other thing is, you know, this become a Republican right now for a vote is a small sacrifice to bring, try to bring this big system down uh, that we have a little chance of it. Thank you. All right, that's yeah. an interesting point. I, I want to go on a second point first because, um, I mean, you could look at it as selling out, which is, is kind of the way I look at it, but there's another angle, which is that um, that's there's, I'm gonna throw you out the window. there are a lot of Republicans who are very uh, clingy to their little fiefdom up here, right? And so the, to the extent that people who are not Republican at all register and vote for somebody who the Randy Rudricks of the world absolutely despise, um, you're really kind of having a few laughs at the expense of the Alaska Republican Party. So that's another uh, another way to look at it. You know, it's like, well, I don't like the Alaska Republican Party, so I'm not going to register. But uh, registering and voting for Ron Paul is 
is probably uh, going to upset them more than not registering. So basically, you're saying that's that's put a stick in the Republican Party's eye by yeah, by you, <laughs> well, you'd be you know just kind of doing it as a as a grief. Um, so anyway, you know that you could you could easily justify it that way. All right, what about his first point? Uh, so yeah, I mean that that's where a lot of federal land uh, ownership is, right? Department of the Interior, and the president actually does have uh, a, some authority to um, to dissolve departments. Right. That's that's an executive administrative uh, uh, power. Yeah. And constitutionally, the federal government's not supposed to own any land. The whole point was to give the whole point, yeah, private not, ownership, not to have a king. Right. Which we do. Well, I, I, especially if you look at the policies that have been put forth for the use of those public lands. I mean, everything like from hunting to fishing to just simple recreation. If you do not have the king's permission well, before you, going onto that land. You know, you you. I mean, look at what's happened with uh, just on the Yukon River in the last couple of years. The yep. way in which the Park Service, the Park Service, has been throwing 70-year-old men in the mud, right, and holding people at gunpoint. And of course, you'd still have the state doing that, but it would be uh, you could at least focus your energy on one one less entity at that point. A little closer to home too. Yeah. All right. Four five eight talk is a number. This is the Saturday morning wake up call. Who's this? Good morning. This is Jim. Good morning, Jim. What's on your mind? Well, I have a question first, and then I guess maybe a statement. The question is, did you guys, uh, did I hear you say that uh, you're going to register as Republican uh, so that you could uh, vote for Ron Paul, and then if Ron Paul did not uh, get the nomination that you were, were done, that you were not just not going to vote, period? I said that, yes. That's jo- Josh Spennett speaking. Go ahead, Josh. Can you you want to explain your position again? Oh well, I just said that uh, Ron Paul, his philosophy is the only thing, only say political candidate. I don't even like thinking about it. Yeah, I'm having a hard time with it. That I can support his philosophy. So just to show my support for his philosophy, I'm willing to register as a Republican. If he's not the candidate, they're all the same to me. So I'm not going to support any of them. Okay, so you're saying that if he's not the candidate, then you're just you're just going to bail from the process, so to speak. Well, yeah, I'm mean, not going to uh, bail from well, the process. The process m- bailed for me about 200 my statement years is ago. That you're, is, is that basically that since you're, uh, you're 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 claiming that it would it would not be morally just to vote for anybody else because Ron Paul is your choice. If he doesn't make it, then you're gone. Right. Right. Okay. Well, as far as I'm concerned. Um, by not voting for someone else, you're doing the same thing that most Republicans have done um, for many years, and that's why we have what we have right now, as far as I'm concerned. You're, if you voted for a Republican, I mean, it's the lesser of the evil. It might not be the moral choice, but is it not rather hypocritical to say, and I'm an independent, and I pretty well uh, like the idea of Ron Paul. There are things I don't like, but okay. is it not hypocritical to say that I'll only vote for Ron Paul, he's my only choice, if not, I'm not voting for anybody, but, because that's a moral decision, but is it not hypocritical to say that I'm going to go in and sign up as a Republican, So just so I can vote for Ron Paul, and if he doesn't make it, then I'm not going to vote for anybody, and we all know, and it's, it's pretty true, if you don't vote for the lesser of the evils, I guess, again, then we can blame you if Obama wins again. Well, I don't see any difference in Obama or the rest of the field out there on the Republican side. I mean, all I have to do is, and I was a little bit younger, um, go back to 2001 and live through the Bush administration with a Republican-controlled House and Republican-controlled Senate. Wait, I don't want that. Didn't we get rid of abortion during that time? No, we didn't. Um, we got the Patriot Act. We got the basic repeal. War One, War Two. War, which opened up War Three and War Four, we have troops in, uh, let's see, Yemen now. We have massive in monetary inflation. We're in we have troops in Uganda. We have troops in Afghanistan. We got five trillion dollars in debt in that time. That was with a completely Republican-controlled House, Senate, and President. They well, did nothing. I will not support them. I support liberty. I support Ron Paul's philosophy. Otherwise, than that. Lesser of two evils is what? I don't even understand lesser. How can I morally justify voting for evil, whether it's lesser or more? Hey, wait, here's the, the best question for you. Jim, if you vote for the lesser of two evils, are you not still voting for evil? Well, yes, you are. But yet at the same time, you've you got to be realistic and look at this in, in the light of 
had we maybe gotten uh, Lesser of the Evils McCain, who I was not in favor of the last time, had we maybe gotten him in, maybe we wouldn't be the trillions of dollars in debt that we are. Maybe we would have only been half as far into debt as we are by allowing uh, letting Obama get in there. No, well, he would I mean, already be in another war. To me, that's war. where the Lesser of the Evil it, is. Do you want to get flooded with water up your belly button do you or know, have, the top of your head? Have you heard of the NDAA? National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021-1022, which authorizes the military to arrest and detain American citizens. Yes, and hold I, them. yes I have heard Do you know that. who sponsored that bill, who came uh, who, up with that bill? Who wrote the bill? No, I don't. John McCain. All right, and as I say, I was not in favor of John McCain. Right. He may have sponsored it, but how about all the, all the other things that Obama has pushed through? Some of those things. Wait, hang, on, we hang on a second, less, Jim. You're you're blaming one man for something that the Congress has done. I'm yeah. talking about every the guy that, single one of the things that people are blaming Obama for have not been done by Obama, but by the Congress. Obama or John McCain wrote those sections for the NDAA. They've that been, got rid of the fourth, fifth, sixth, right. seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth and amendments. And as I told you, I was not first. in favor of John McCain. I was not. Right. I'm just but saying Obama, that I don't see that he's any different than any of them. But. Obama, up. Congress may have, have done those, but Obama was the one who signed them. Hey, we're coming up on the news right here. You've got a Saturday morning wake-up call on KFAR. Yeah, this one right here goes out to all the babies, mamas, 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 mamas. <laughs> Baby mama's mama. Yeah, go like this. All right, you've got it on KFAR. This is Local Talk Radio. It's our newest Saturday morning show, a Saturday morning wake-up call. Uh, we will we directly into Patriots Lament at 10 o'clock, so uh, make sure that you tell all your friends that you can start listening now a little bit earlier on Saturday morning for local radio right here in Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh, we've got all four lines there's, on hold. Um, yeah, there's another angle from that last call I wanted to talk about. Hang on a second, Dave. Before you get going, I want to yeah. make sure that everybody knows who we're talking with. I'm Steve Floyd, the, uh, the monkey behind the machine. I'm the one that basically runs the board, but the real hosts are uh, the folks here that pay for the show. Aaron Bennett, who is uh, actually working today, uh, so he's up on the North Slope today. Uh, Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises and uh, Dave Giesel here from the Fairbanks Campaign for Letterby. Okay, go ahead, Dave. So um, by by voting, or at least by talking about, well, we got to vote for the lesser of two evils. Anyway, just in that action, you're sort of implying that you're placing some sort of faith in the voting system, right, which, which is a democratic system. And we talked about this on the show either last week or a couple weeks ago. The premise of democracy, the basic premise of it, the first thing that has to happen for it to work is people have to vote for someone who represents them, right? The whole premise of democracy is everybody goes out and votes for somebody who represents them, and the, if the majority of people are represented by guy X, then he is going to provide the most people with the most satisfaction. So as soon as you start voting for people who don't represent you, Right, which is this whole lesser of two evils thing, which everybody claims that they vote, voted for the lesser of two evils, Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever. Nobody actually claims they voted for somebody who represented them. As soon as you do that, you've given up on the primary basic premise of democracy. Representatives. Which is that you're voting for someone who represents you, whether they can win or not. Right, Electability isn't part of that, um, the premise of the whole idea. And yeah. so if you're going to give up on the, if you're going to, you know, it's, well, we got to vote for the lesser of two evils because that's the way the system works. That's actually the way the system is guaranteed never to work because it will never be a representative uh, government. I don't think democracy could work for a whole bunch of other economic reasons. But if you want to talk about the, like the fantasy of it, even in little happy voting fantasy land, <laughs> it, it only works if you vote for somebody who represents you. But what if nobody's running that actually represents my point of view? Then not voting would be what you would have to do to have a uh, accurate democracy. So then, I, I, but I, then, but then, if the majority of people don't vote, you would have to have nobody in office if you wanted to have a democracy, right? So in order if, for if, that to really work, then shouldn't we actually have a choice on the ballot every single time, none well, of the above? You can you can write somebody in. I mean, that's always there. No, but, but what I'm saying is, is that what if we actually had on the ballot none of the above? 
And if yeah, none of the be, if, 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 if none the majority of, if people none of the above, that, the office stays man, empty. and then it would be a vacant office. Yeah. See, now that I could get behind because the way it is right now, I I go in there and I've got candidate A who I don't agree with and candidate B who I don't agree with. Yeah. And then I I, I can write in somebody who I know is not going to win. Vermin Supreme. Or yeah. or I or, or I can choose not to vote at all. And either way, either candidate A who I don't agree with, or can it be who I don't agree with, it's going to win, and therefore somebody is going to end up in office with the power, with my money, that I have absolutely no power to do anything about. Yeah. So if, we, if, we, if there were some way to actually get none of the above onto the ballot... Mm, that'd so be a good ballot drive. So, so that we could, actually, we could actually choose to put nobody... I know who office. I wouldn't vote for every time. <laughs> they could be part of the godless monkey party. Oh, yes. snap. Um, <laughs> you guys want to go to the phones? Well, real quick, the other thing that we were talking about at, um, during the break was it takes, you know, with this lesser two parties with, with Obama and stuff, it takes a House, a Senate to pass something before the president can sign it. So the NDAA, we had a Republican majority House that passed the NDAA. And the senators on the Republican side were the ones that pushed it more than anyone. I mean, we've we've uh, put them on our website, John McCain and um, Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham, they're going nuts. I mean, they're frothing at the mouth to get this thing passed. So it's not about the party. Lesser of two evils, you're still saying one is evil. How can you morally and good conscience vote for evil, whether it's less or more of? For what it's worth, um, if we want to talk about George W. Bush as opposed to Obama, George W. Bush vetoed the least bills of any president ever. So in terms of signing bills. So if we're going to talk about, well, they got, he had to sign it, the, con- the House and blah, 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 put it in front of him. Well, so let's talk about the uh, the lesser of two evils, or so we're told, predecessor who vetoed the least bills ever. Well, I, I've, I've thought, I think I've thought of a good illustration for those who continue to argue, well, you have to vote for the lesser of two evils. Who would be lesser in your mind of the two evils, Joseph Stalin or Adolf Hitler? I like Stalin's hair better. Well, who would be the lesser of the two evils in that? In, <laughs> and in, in his that, mustache. In that show. That's pretty. Yeah, his mustache, mustache is pretty. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. His, but his his mustache was too bushy. I think Hitler had a uh, had a nicer trim. The Shows point, what you know. <laughs> the point is this: if you vote, if if the two of them were running an election against each other, and you went out and you you could say proudly, "Hey, I vote. Hey, at least I voted for Stalin." Well, Stalin just starved people to death. He didn't actively. Oh, uh, no, he didn't. Well, that's, he, he that's did. true. He, he, he rounded, actively, he rounded and, them up. And who, but the who majority of people who he killed, he just starved to death. So who killed more? <laughs> right. And 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 yeah, and, well, did, and yeah. who who was more evil? Our ally. <laughs> Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Are you for Stalin or for Hitler? For neither. All right. What do you? Oh, right. an anarchist then. Who, who who is this? This is Randy. Good morning, Randy. Hi there. I just want to say that I think Josh Bennett is a very wise man for uh, participating in the process to uh, try to elect a very good man like Ron Paul, because the way I look at it, a party is just a vehicle to an end. I I imagine the analogy of a city buses. Uh, if I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I can go north or I can go south, and there's a city bus that's going to carry me north if that's the direction I want to go on. Even if everybody on there is a communist or I don't agree with them, I'll get on that bus. But because the bus itself is not evil. However, if the bus, you know how they have big advertisements sometimes, if the bus says on it that we all support communism or something like that, then I wouldn't get on the bus. I'd rather walk than get on that bus. But if the bus is just a vehicle for a, for a direction, I'll get on the bus. And then someone might say, well, aren't you guilty by association uh, sitting amongst all those communists that are in that bus? And then I would say, no, because while I'm riding, I'm talking with them, trying to talk them out of it. So bravo to you, uh, Josh, for uh, jumping into the Republican Party and uh, no, trying to support gonna, the no. guy that you want to support. All right, Josh, now, does it, in, in light of getting Randy's endorsement, how do you feel now? Yeah, no, it's all right. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I actually, and I'll go a little bit further here, I also don't think that Ron Paul is going to be able to get anything done if he is elected to change the course of the country. Well, um, but I do think that uh, the one thing that he would be able to do is, and the only reason why, well, not the only reason, but one of the reasons why I would support him, he would have a bully pulpit like nobody's ever got. And I can imagine him sitting and having a press conference and reading us a book 
called Man Economy in the State, maybe. I mean, he'd have four years to educate the country, and that'd be pretty sweet. But real change, I don't really see it. Not trying to dash the hopes of folks, but I like his ideals, but I don't actually believe the one man is going to change anything. The only thing he can change, which I do support, is people's minds and hearts, which is what we should all be trying to do in the first place. But as far as, yeah, I could eat just as easily not vote on Tuesday. Thanks for the call, Randy. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning. This is the Saturday morning wake-up call. Who is this? It's Winston. Winston, what's on your mind today? Oh, all politics is local. All uh, politics is local? Yes. Okay. Uh, 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 I have I have voted for Disney characters for years. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, nice. That's what I'm talking but, about. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, just because the the uh, uh, there's a presidential election uh, doesn't mean that uh, you have to vote for either one of the presidential. Uh, but you have people like Davies and Winters in the. Uh, 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 you know, in the, in, the, in the North Star Borough, and and you didn't. Uh, 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 if you don't vote, you can, you don't you do, you don't stand a chance to vote them out. Uh, 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 if if the person doesn't participate in the in the voting process, I mean, uh, and Randy's thing about the the bus, the bus is evil. Uh, 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 yeah, like I say, it's just uh, uh, you've got to participate if you're going to find a representative to elect you. And if you're the type of person that they're looking to represent, they're going to change to get your vote. Winston, I think you nice. missed. I think you missed <laughs> Wednesday's uh, or uh, Randy's point, though. I think he was saying that the process is the bus. Didn't wasn't that, or was he saying the party is? The oh, bus? I, I, is he I, saying I the party? He yeah. was saying the party was okay. the bus. Well, uh, that was the way I understood. Pretty lame party bus. <laughs> Well, and the other can thing you, too, can you, can you drink that, on the bus? I mean, is that is that? that you also I, do have. The, I don't care what part it is, as long as I got my booze. The pain on the side, unfortunately, too. When he said if it said communist on the side, it wouldn't get on. But unfortunately, our two parties you either have communist written on the side or fascist written on the side. So take your pick. All right, uh, Winston. Let me ask you this: If, if it, you believe uh, very strongly that the only way to make a difference is by voting. Have, when you voted here in the North Star Borough, and you told them, no, we cannot have a ban on wood stoves, and they turned uh, around uh, and passed a ban on wood stoves, how, what good did me, your vote do? Yeah. Uh, let me clarify something. I don't live in the borough. I was just using that as an example. Hmm. All right. I think okay. locally in this borough, we have more a more effective way to make change by simply doing personal nullification, if you want to use that. Wait, then you mean like not obeying the, uh, the borough ordinances? I, I think um, I think Winston might have just stumbled across a, a possible solution, although a difficult one for some people. Leaves the borough. Correct. Ah, thanks, Winston, for the call. Four five eight dog is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to the Saturday morning wake up call. Who's this? This is Maria. Maria, good morning. What's on your mind today? Um, I was thinking about the party, um, joining the party and voting for people that you don't support and that are ideologically inconsistent. Um, So if the party doesn't nominate Ron Paul. And I was just thinking about a few years ago, a group of you guys went down to the state and tried to infiltrate the party and take it over. Is that? Um, it, yeah, the, well, the 2008 uh, convention was kind of a zoo, yeah. And and the, the idea, you know, kind of going along with Randy's analogy a little bit, is if enough libertarians get involved in the party, that will be the party, and, you know. And, and I'm not saying the Republican Party is the answer, but I think if the Republicans had any brains at all, they would embrace this. Because uh, they're talking about trying to save their party, this is what Ron Paul would do it. Because if he gets the Republican nomination, I mean, I'm getting calls at home from people that were involved with No Nukes North saying, uh, Obama's got us in more wars than anybody else has. I'm supporting Ron Paul. He is going to straddle. I mean, if he got the Republican nomination, you'd have a whole bunch of people all over the country that are in other parties that would have to join the Republicans. That would change the Republican Party. It might really be the Republican Party 
Do, Again. So that's yes. Yeah, so that's the question. When um, when people in the Republican Party say we need to save it, um, I think what they're saying. I mean, y- your interpretation is interesting. You're saying, you know, keep the mechanism intact and change the ideology of the party. Exactly. And I think my interpretation of the people who say we need to save the party, just from my time at the 2008 convention, was we need to paint fascism in bigger letters on the bus, we need to kill more people, and we need to get Americans convinced that that's what we want to do. Oh, exactly. That's exactly right. And especially in this state... Randy Rudrick, I mean, the, everybody that I know that's a, that's a straight party ticket kind of person, uh, is they're top-down managers. They have absolutely no faith in the grassroots individual. But, you know, if, the, if they were smart, they've got Ron Paul running on this ticket. I wish he wouldn't have run on the Republican ticket. Yeah, here, here. I wish he yeah, would have run no as joke. an independent or whatever. I, don't, yeah. I wouldn't care because that's really more representative of what's actually happening today. But whatever it takes, I'm going to support him, and I am not voting for any of the other guys. There's no way I'm voting for one of them. And I agree with you wholeheartedly, David. You um, you vote for you vote your conscience every time, and you don't vote for someone who doesn't represent you. Yeah, I think uh, John Adams actually said something about that, didn't he? Yeah, no. he, had... I, he, he might have. <laughs> yeah, he did. No, he I'm trying to think. Of, I was, he. Uh, Gosh, what? I can't remember. Well, exactly. well, well you guys are trying to figure that out, Maria. I, I, I have a question for you, Maria. Okay. All right. Uh, do you remember back in the 2008 uh, general election when uh, Senator Ted Stevens actually, uh, in the primary, he had uh, he had a challenger um, and lost, or, or he won in, oh, right, in the, right, right, against right, his challenger. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, Bob Bird ran in the uh, the general election oh, okay. as uh-huh. an as the uh, uh, an independent, I believe, a libertarian Alaska Independence Party. I don't remember. I don't remember. But yeah, I had an, a number of people blaming me personally for Mark Baggage being elected right. as our senator because I personally went out and voted for Bob Bird right. yeah. uh, in, uh, in the general election because I personally could not stomach what Ted Stevens was doing to our state. Or do our nation, and I, I don't know how many times on on, on my radio show I, I have people calling in to chastise me personally for Mark Baggage winning that election, even though the Republican Party they went ahead and nominated someone who had been convicted of corruption charges. Now obviously that uh, conviction was thrown out. He was not declared not guilty. It was thrown out because of. Other charges that were levied against the people who prosecuted him. Maria, what have we gotten into? Well, it's the herd mentality. You're involved in the herd mentality. And, you know, people have got to have the faith to stand up for their convictions, I think, is all, really. Um, But, uh, anyway, I think uh, Ron Paul is the most most like George Washington, perhaps. Um, He's the best candidate we've had for, well, since I've been around, for sure. yeah, and, if, and, if, oh, if we're gonna if we're gonna be, to if we're gonna believe or participate in the system, it, it's premised on selecting people who actually represent you and are consistent and aren't lying to you. Well, uh, so. and, and and I wanted to say something to Josh about what his uh, what Ron Paul has for clout in D.C. and his ability to actually get something done. I think the most important quality that we need in a president is that leadership and that that consistency that Ron Paul's demonstrated. So I do have faith that he can change the course of history. Anyway. All right. Thanks, Maria. I appreciate the call. 458-TALK is the number. This is the Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's this? This is Gordon. Good morning, Gordon. What's on your mind today? Well, I had to call in. uh, Was somebody forcing you to? Is there somebody holding you at gunpoint making you call in? You said you had to call in. Go ahead. I'm I'm, I'm giving you a hard time, Gordon. What's on your mind? In a circle and whine. But Josh makes a little bit of sense because he says, I'll support the guy that expresses a desire to do things that I want to see get done, and that's the right thing to do. But if he doesn't win and the party, the Republican Party, wins, and they can elect eight or nine senators or two more people in the uh, House and get a majority, I'm going to support the Republican because... I've been around a long time, and I've probably been voting longer than you've been uh, alive. And I know that the thing to do is to take the lesser of two evils. 
because I called uh, Stevens a crook and a weasel a long time before he got caught. But you still kept but voting how, for him. How is lesser? I, of, how is lesser of two evils worked out? It first? didn't work. No, no, but I mean, yeah. over the course of your yeah. life, like I, people go, oh, "I've been voting longer study. than you. I've been voting longer than you've been alive." So is yeah. is that like Stockholm syndrome alive. or what? How long? How is that? How has that worked out though? You've been voting for thirty, forty years. Um, <laughs> how have things uh, changed over those thirty or forty years? The better or the worse? Well, let me answer your question by saying this: I have never missed voting in an election. School local or national, in 50 years. Now, I think that you do the best you can. You work within the group that you work with, and if you if it doesn't come out just the way you want it, then you pick the people who might have a chance of expressing the right thing. You stay home, sit on your hands, or sit in a circle and hold hands, and whine. I joined the party and tried to change the party. I, I have a I have a question. This is going to be like an analogy. So let's say your car breaks down and you need you need a wrench to fix it, and there's a hammer in your trunk, and you go, well, I only have one tool, so let's try and fix it with the hammer. And you start hammering away, and it it looks like it's getting worse. And it's like, well, I still only have one tool. My car still doesn't run. So you just keep on hammering and hammering and hammering on it. Parts start falling off and stuff because you're not using the right tool well, to, to affect the, the desired outcome. Is hammering it. more going to uh, going to be better or hammering softer? Is that going to help fix the car? No, you got it exactly right. That's what you're doing. You're sitting around with a hammer and you're saying, I don't like the way they're talking or... There's this this guy over well, there's here. A, there's a 200 year uh, record of voting of out. voting working really 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 poorly in this country. Jordan, I think and so I, I'm, you I'm questioning the, the premise that uh, if we just vote for just a little bit more, just a little more voting, just one more election, two more elections, well, well, it's, it's, it's going to be it's different. It's the same for the philosophy that's gotten us into ever. the spending mess that we're in right now. We're trying yeah. to spend our way out of this this deficit that we've got. And, uh, Gordon, do you support the the bailouts? No, but. You don't. You don't have a voice in it. You sit around and yammer. But I had at least when I go to a party Gordon, meeting th- and this, when I belong to a party. This, this might surprise you. I have you. an opportunity to put my money where my mouth is and support somebody that could make a change. Gordon, now, this might this all. might surprise you, but I, I actually you're, you're painting me along with a number of other people here with a very very broad brush. You don't know me. Okay, you I. Don't know Exactly. Well, I have actually right voted in every field. election since I came of uh, legal age when I was 18. And I have seen my vote continually thwarted over and over and over again. I have not said that I'm not going to vote. But like Dave, hammering when I should be wrenching, I find myself at a point right now where I'm thinking, you know, maybe I should stop hammering. Gordon, I'm going to uh, let you go. Appreciate the phone call. 458-TALK. Oh, I just want to say that since I stopped voting, I, I like the last caller, have not missed it. <laughs> you haven't missed it. All right. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Teresa. Teresa, good morning. What's on your mind? Well, Steve, um, I'd like to give you a hard time. <laughs> no, I know you do. Go ahead. That's all right. <laughs> I think you're giving too much uh, credence to the Republican Party. I think you're making them a little too important. You're giving them a little power over you. Um, you know, let's say, I, I'm not sure your position exactly, what's in your heart, but let's say you're really a... Um, a Ron Paul guy, you really support him, you'd love to cast your vote for him, but because of the importance you're giving to belonging or not belonging to the Republican Party, you're allowing them to rob you of your vote, your voice, of your chosen candidate. And, uh, you know, I was a nonpartisan all my voting life, and I became a Ron Paul Republican so that I'd be able to vote for him in the last election cycle, and I'm going to be very happy to, to do that again because I think that our vote in this uh, caucus is going to make a difference, maybe not in the general election by the time it gets to us. They already know who the president is. But right now, our vote is really weighty. It's really going to make a difference. And I, I'm a Christian, so I vote for character. I'm not into all these political uh, this and that. But um, I just wanted to, I know you're a Christian too, and I wanted to give you kind of an, an analogy of what I'm talking about. Like when the Apostle Paul talked about um, idols, and he said, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and we have freedom in Christ. You know, we, So I'm saying that the Republican Party is nothing in the world. It's 
just an empty vehicle, and if I have to become a Republican to cast my vote and make a difference for what's right, then uh, that's what I'm going to do. So I just wanted you to consider that line of thinking. And you, you, um, I appreciate you being willing to challenge my thinking, Teresa. I really do. I, I'm, I'm not. The reason why I'm not convinced uh, in terms of want of having to go out and become a Republican in order to vote for Ron Paul is because of what the Republican Party stands for. If if it were turned around, and I'm just and I just want to paint this picture for you in just a moment. Let us say that in 1934 there were a man running against uh, Adolf Hitler in Germany, but he was running on the Nazi ticket. And the only way to vote him in to challenge Hitler would be to become a Nazi in order to be able to cast your vote. Would you become a Nazi in order to cast your vote for? Absolutely. No, you, Absolutely. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't have to become a Nazi. You just have to register as one. Exactly. If enough people did that with with the right heart, imagine the change that would have happened. Absolutely. I think we should um, take yeah. steps that allow us to give a voice, give some power behind what we believe is right. This is what uh, Maria was talking about when she said, you know, taking over the Republican Party is actually changing the um, the ideas behind it. The the well, danger I... the danger of that, of course, um, if you talk, I mean, you, you just use the, the power word. Um, if you talk about power and liberty, um, you can't enforce, uh, you can't enforce liberty with power. And that's one of the directions that parties tend to go. People get in a room and and we all go, oh, we're all right, we're all right, we're so right that other people should be right with us, um, or else. Whether and that's, they like it or not. Right, and I'm not saying that's necessarily the direction that would go, but that's the the major danger of becoming um, very strongly tied into the political process is that there's always that underlying power. All right, Teresa, thanks for the call. We're going to move on. Josh. I was just going to read a quote from John Quincy Adams that uh, Dave found he was talking about earlier. Always vote for principle. Though you may vote alone, you may cherish the sweetest reflection that your vote is never lost. So even if you lose in the election, you personally voted for what was right. I, I like that. John, John, was it John Adams or John Quincy? Quincy is John Adams. Sons. Do we have time to play we, that? Uh, we have if? about uh, two and a half minutes here. How long is that? Uh, what if with Ron Paul? It's three minutes and 44 oh, seconds, we'll so we don't have enough time for the whole uh, the whole thing. We do have something queued up here from YouTube on uh, Ron Ball's What If, so we're going to try to do that in the next hour here. Uh, two and a half minutes, go back to the phones. Sure. Four and a half, uh, four, five, eight, talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to the Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's this? Hey, good morning. It's Nathan. Hey, who is this? What's your name? Hi, this is Nathan. Can you hear me? Nathan, I can hear you. Go ahead. All right, there we go. Um... I just wanted to comment on the, uh, the the voting or not voting, and um, I agree with what uh, uh, John Adams said. I, I voted for uh, Ross Perot uh, back in the uh, Bush Clinton uh, Ross Perot election and uh, lost. Uh, but uh, I may have lost the election, but one thing I didn't lose was character. Uh, I I don't regret that necessarily. Um, I do understand what people say when they say a vote for uh, uh, Ross Perot uh, was, you know, split the, the party vote. That's why we got stuck with Clinton. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that I had not voted for uh, uh, George Bush Sr. But when in regard to the uh, what Maria was talking about, um, it's not so much that we're wanting to take over the Republican Party. Um, it's not so much that, there were, that we're wanting to change the ideals of the Republican Party. Uh, what we're looking at is what the Republican Party used to be. Um, I consider myself to be more of a Ronald Reagan uh, era Republican, uh, if I'm going to label myself in, uh, in line with, with Republicans. Uh, and a vote for, if I want to be able to vote for Ron Paul, um, I've got to be registered as a Republican. Uh, if, if you're going to wait for the general election to cast a vote for Ron Paul, uh, he's not going to be on the ticket. And, well, yeah, and also um, the, the primary vote is not binding legally or anything like that. So you're actually not voting for coercive authority by voting in the primary also. Coming up on the news, Patriots Lament is next.
All right, we've got a uh, slight lockup here in our computer, so I need to go and uh, reset something uh, before we get going here on the show. I love having technological difficulties. It reminds me, of course, that we are entirely too dependent on our technology. I am Steve Floyd, and this is where we're on the air, but our computer. Technology thing when we're on a radio station. Yeah, exactly. I, I, you know, we we've talked about how uh, dependent we are as a society on technology these days, and uh, here we are improving it with a lockup. I uh, find further irony in the fact that we're talking about Ron Paul and this is happening. Mm. Dun 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 dun. Yeah. Keep talking. Can, yep. Uh, hi. <laughs> Welcome to Patriots Laments Radio. This is. I'm not Steve. Steve's trying to fix our computer. Dave Giesel and I are here. Dave's from Campaign for Liberty. I'm from Fairbanks and Bighorn Enterprises. Big, yeah, that's right. One so, of the, one of the, uh, the sponsors of the program here, uh, Bighorn Enterprises, of course. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to the program. Uh, we uh, just started a new show this morning at 9 a.m. We were calling it the Saturday morning wake-up call. We just got done with that. At the end of the show here in the last hour, we were talking about uh, the issue of voting for the lesser of two evils or becoming a part of a party in order to vote someone else in who might afford change. And I, kind of one of the things that I, I, I find myself thinking about is, oh, there, there we go, we're back up and running now with the music. Uh, theme song, Hey Hey by Super Chick. Uh, off the album Rock What You Got, by the way, in case you're wondering. All right, now we're officially started the show. We can stop the music. Here's the thing. Uh, I, our last caller in the last hour said that he is a Ronald Reagan Republican, and I hear that bandied about quite a bit as if somehow uh, that's a specific wing of the Republican Party. How many uh, – and here's the other I- issue in terms of uh, people are like, well, yeah, look at the Obama Supreme Court appointees. Well, if, if we don't get a Republican in, we're going to get more leftists on the Supreme Court. Who did we get from Ronald Reagan in the Supreme Court? Do you know? Off the top of your head? Ginsburg. Uh, no, Ginsburg was no, a Clinton that was, that was appointee. Clinton, yeah. uh, I'm going to see if we can try to find here. Uh, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, Bush's appointees. Uh, <laughs> we, we could talk about them, right? Oh, my gosh. Uh, well, well, I, well I, I mean, for the last... May, I mean, you've been doing this a lot. I mean, actively with the Campaign for Liberty, I've been talking about this more just because I've been hiding in a hole for part of my life. Yeah, smarter. The uh, What have we been talking about since May 28th? There is no difference in the parties, yeah. right? Well, the I mean, even the if you want to talk about Supreme Court appointees, uh, the ones who are actually standing up for, you know, the Bill of Rights, and it's it's a total crapshoot. Yeah. Right? Uh, what was the one that, that uh, like, three people supported? And you talked about it on one of our previous shows. Yeah. There was a ruling. Anyway, um yeah, the Bush appointees have right. signed off on on you know indefinite detention and torture and all these things. So who cares if they're a Bush or a Clinton or a Reagan appointee? I mean they they're going to sell out just as much as anybody. They're, they're people. They, they, Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was the only one that voted in the Supreme Court when they had a issue of the Fourth Amendment whether they needed to have a warrant before they entered someone's home. Oh yeah, that's what it was. She was the only one that voted against it. And isn't she, she said, one of yes, these? You must evil have a whip, one of these evil. Uh, Liberals? Yeah, that's yeah. what we're told. Which is really interesting. Maybe she is a lot smarter than we give her credit for when she goes over to other countries and says, no, you don't want to model your constitution after ours. Maybe there's some wisdom in that. <laughs> yeah, she's because seen it from the inside. Because she's sitting there and seeing it being dismantled, and even she voted for the rule of law. And so, yeah, maybe she's right. You don't want to model your constitution after ours. I don't know. <laughs> We've got all Just four saying. lines on hold already. Uh, did you like to go to the lines now or play that Ron Paul clip? Let's play some Ron. All the right, man. let's have some Ron Paul on the radio here. This is uh, the what if speech that has been so often talked about uh, by Ron Paul. Madam Speaker, I have a few questions for my colleagues. What if our foreign policy of the past century is deeply flawed and has not served our national security interests? What if we wake up one day and realize that the terrorist threat is a predictable consequence of our meddling in the affairs of others and has nothing to do with us being free and prosperous? What if propping up repressive regimes in the Middle East endangers both the United States and Israel? 
What if occupying countries like Iraq and Afghanistan and bombing Pakistan is directly related to the hatred directed toward us? What if someday it dawns on us that losing over 5,000 American military personnel in the Middle East since 9-11 is not a fair trade-off for the loss of nearly 3,000 American citizens, no matter how many Iraqi, Pakistani, and Afghan people are killed or displaced? What if we finally decide that torture, even if called enhanced interrogation technique, is self-destructive and produces no useful information and that contracting it out to a third world nation is just as evil? What if it is finally realized that war and military spending is always destructive to the economy? What if all wartime spending is paid for through the deceitful and evil process of inflating and borrowing? What if we finally see that wartime conditions always undermine personal liberty? What if conservatives who preach small government wake up and realize that our interventionist foreign policy provides the greatest incentive to expand the government? What if conservatives understood once again that their only logical position is to reject military intervention and managing an empire throughout the world? What if the American people woke up and understood that the official reasons for going to war are almost always based on lies and promoted by war propaganda in order to serve special interests? What if we as a nation came to realize that the quest for empire eventually destroys all great nations? What if Obama has no intention of leaving Iraq? What if a military draft is being planned for for the wars that will spread out if our foreign policy is not changed? What if the American people learn the truth? That our foreign policy has nothing to do with national security, that it never changes from one administration to the next? What if war and preparation for war is a racket serving the special interests? What if President Obama is completely wrong about Afghanistan and turns out worse than Iraq and Vietnam put together? What if Christianity actually teaches peace and not preventive wars of aggression? What if diplomacy is found to be superior to bombs and bribes in protecting America? What happens if my concerns are completely unfounded? Nothing. But what happens if my concerns are justified and ignored? Nothing good. And I yield back the balance of my time. If you look that up on YouTube, you will find uh, some really, really cool graphics that go along with that that include uh, word for word the entire transcript of what you just heard uh, by Ron Paul. It's All you need to do is go to YouTube and uh, type in what if Ron Paul and you'll see that entire speech with the graphics there for you. Yeah, that's that's that one's awesome. There's one reason of many, but that one gives a good idea of why I like Ron Paul. I uh, again, uh, Ron that Paul a, was, That's a powerful one. By the way, if you are just joining us here, this is Patriots Lament, and Ron Paul will be in Fairbanks uh, tomorrow at the Westmark at one o'clock. Yes, yep, there, 1 are, there are 800 seats, so the idea would be to get there uh, before one if you'd like to get a seat. I yeah, guess. and there is uh, on Ron Paul 2012, the official campaign actually had. They're supposedly supposed to be fixed, and I just got an email. They had it at the Carlson Center, but it is at the West Market. It's not going to be at the Carlson Center. And before I forget, I think there's a uh, meetup at the Denny's at 4 o'clock today for Ron Paul supporters. Yeah, they're going to talk today? about the um, the primary process. So the, the election – well, it's not even an election. It's a presidential preference poll is right. what it's called. That's on Tuesday. And I think the Carlson Center is the only voting location. Yeah. So if you want to vote, you have to find your way down to the Carlson Center. But the uh, the significant part of the process is the delegate selection afterwards. That's where they select the delegates to go to the convention to represent, you know, each district um, or each precinct, actually, right? I think. And so um, so they they're going to talk about how you participate in that process, and it's very nuanced and convoluted and things like that. So if you're interested in in uh, doing more than just voting on Tuesday, and and you know we were talking about taking over the Republican Party or going and crashing their convention again. 
um, you definitely want to go to the uh, the meeting at Denny's because they're going to talk about how to do that today. Four five eight talk is the number. Let's go back to the phone lines. Good morning, caller. And this is Patriots Lament. Who's this? This is Bill. Bill, what's on your mind today? I would like to ask Juan Paul if he's listening right now. Please get out of the Republican Party and join the Independent ticket. And if he would, I'm not going to go ahead and join the Republic just because. I'm going to ask Ron Paul to join my side instead of me joining his. I think what we need here, if Joe Vogler was alive uh, today, he would say, it's time we almost got the federal government out of Alaska. And if the people would have voted or would have followed Joe Vogler's advice back when he was alive, before the federal government killed him, uh, I think that uh, our state would have been a much stronger, would have been much uh, viable, would have been something that uh, a beacon upon the hill that uh, democracy is searching for today. So uh, uh, please do not vote for Ron Paul. Let him fall in the pri- in the uh, uh, the primary. So it'll force his hand to go independent, because if he's a true patriot of the United States of America, he would join the independent party and put America back on the track of democracy and uh, <clears throat> all the things that that we hoped for in the beginning. I'm tired of being a ping pong ball to go back and forth from Democratic to Republican just because somebody says uh, uh, things that I like them like to hear. I'm asking you, Ron Paul, to get out of the Republican race and go independent and show your true patriotism as a true American and come back to the independent party. That's my belief. All right. I, yeah, I, I would actually uh, like to see that myself. Yeah, my I agree. I wish he was not running as a Republican. But if you look at strategy wise, if he had started from day one saying, "Hi, I'm Ron Paul. I'm running as an independent," he would get that would be the last time you heard of him. Right. Literally, he would have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars just to get an ad. For, Fun, yeah, it getting would basically be the last time you'd hear of him, wouldn't it? Getting on ballots and stuff like that's very very challenging. He ran as a uh, libertarian in 1988. And um, from that experience, uh, well, Lou Rockwell has talked about this because Lou Rockwell helped with his campaign in 88. The amount of time needed to get on ballots as an independent candidate, uh, not even talking about the the advertising and all the other you know money raising you have to do, is just insanely intensive. And so and can I say one more thing? Yep. Sure. Uh, as far as also in Alaska, please, people, stop with the R's and the D's and go I. Let's get back to Alaska. Let's take Alaska back from the federal government and say enough is enough. Yeah. And let's start the let's start the fight at home. We have to start the fight at home. We we, we you know we let it go all the way to the White House and it's gotten us nowhere. I mean they call us the bridge to nowhere now still today. We cannot do anything without that hanging over our head. Really good point. Yeah, that's that's yep. true. You know, in Alaska, you actually do have a very very high percentage of uh, registered independents, um, or you know, not not. I'm, of, I'm, not I'm, a, I am I'm officially an unaffiliated voter. Right, that's, that's, how, that's how I am registered as un, a great big U, unaffiliated. Right. There's a lot of of unaffiliated or independent. I, I think it's like more than half. Um, but it's a shame. Fifty-seven percent, as a matter of fact. Okay. Mm-hmm. So unaffiliated. It, yeah, I thought it was sixty, right? So that's that's right there. Um, so as this caller is pointing out, it's kind of a shame that there aren't uh, more people who who just say no. You know, parties. No. That, to, to heck with parties. I'm just going to run as me. Thanks for the call. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hi. Good morning. I'm Terry. Terry, what's on your mind today? Well, before I get to that, two comments on the previous caller. One previous caller referred to the independent party, a contradiction of terms. If one is an independent, <laughs> yeah. one is not a member of any party. Good point. Uh, the other thing, if you picked up on it, it went by rather fast. Uh, remember, he uh, intimated that the federal government murdered Joe Vogler. 
He did. Yes, he did. So I thought I would highlight that. I only actually I called to uh, since we talked about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I do have to admit that uh, she has been very, very big on the legal principle of comedy. <laughs> Let me explain that word. It sounds very much like comedy, like Jay Leno and telling jokes in a comedy club, but it's not comedy. It's comedy, C-O-M-I-T-Y. And that has to do with the relationship between state law and federal law. And she has been quite strong and has quite a track record of uh, upholding uh, the right of states to determine their own laws. Uh, the idea that a state Supreme Court or in state courts will know better what state laws mean than would a federal court or the U.S. Supreme Court. So to that extent, she actually, and in that particular area, comes through as quite a conservative. Have you ever noticed that? That's a really good point. Uh, I mean, that, that whole aspect of the, the Tenth Amendment, that the states are supposed to have the powers not specifically yielded to the federal government, that, that is being complete, that's being challenged at every turn. We now have a basically a national government instead of a federal government. And, you know, to have somebody, even if they're of a different party or a different political point of view holding up that principle, I think that ought to be applauded. And you're right on the money with that. Yeah, yeah, we... Uh I'm all for the individual. I mean, who cares about what party they are? If they do the right thing, then they should be applauded for it. When they do the wrong thing, they should be called out on it, which is why, unfortunately, we have to call out the Republican Party daily because they're constantly doing the wrong thing. Yeah, talking about allowing states to to do their own thing, I mean, it's even going beyond. I mean, right and wrong is largely, you know, an opinion matter, and you could have somebody in the Supreme Court who says, well, I believe that this is wrong. And even though the federal government has no authority to do it, I'm going to rule this way just because I think blah, blah, blah. And so then even if they're doing something that you agree with, they're usurping the, the uh, jurisdiction let, as let, it's laid let, out in the Constitution. Let, so Let me interject this. Uh, amongst our checks and balances in the triangle of government, uh, the three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial, we really have a very weak check and balance uh, upon the judicial. Mm. Uh, we kind of have to wait for, uh, for let's say, a, a, a change of law or a change of the Constitution or occasionally, once in a great while, the Supreme Court will overturn, or I'm sorry, reverse itself. They... They did do that uh, just a few times. Very and, rare. Uh, yes, it is. And we do, I think, now, uh, Great Britain's Parliament, their House of Lords had the uh, ability to uh, to overturn the uh, British Supreme Court. And I do think we need something. Uh, I will just throw something out and say that if the United States Senate were to vote by oh uh, two thirds uh, to they could then re- they could then overturn the Supreme Court that it would have it would have to be something that uh, was not just a simple minority a simple majority based on who showed up that day the Constitution does give Congress the authority to overturn the Supreme Court they used to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, early on, that was not something that was so strange. Today, we have this thing that the judiciary is the end-all, be-all. When the Supreme Court says it, well, they said it was unconstitutional, it's over with. Well, or it, it is constitutional, it is so su- it's done. It is the Supreme Court, after all. Yeah, but it, it was never... Supreme over everything, right? Yeah, it was never intended to be that way. There are just nine where, people where, on there, and they're no better you, than anyone else. Where do you find in the Constitution that the Congress has the right to overturn the Supreme Court? The amendment process. It well, happened. It, I mean, well, I know that I that's not a to... real easy process, but I don't think it should be an easy process because the reason we had the Supreme Court was a check and balance. And if it's too easily that the Congress can just override the Supreme Court, then we don't really have a check there because they can pass a law and then the Supreme Court says, well, that's that violates the Constitution. They say, well, we don't care. We're just going to override you. I'd be, 
you'd have to be really careful to give them too much leeway either way. That's why we had the amendment process because it was a lot harder. It happened back in 19 or 1789 with Georgia versus United uh, Georgia versus Chisholm, and um, the Supreme Court held that the people were superior, were supreme, and that a citizen of one state could sue another state, and the that was the ruling. And the amendment process is why we got the 11th Amendment that said, no, if you're from one state, you can't sue another unless the federal court allows you to. But that, That's correct, and uh, that was adopted February 7th in 1795. Essentially, you're saying in different terms what I had said, that the only check and balance we currently have is to uh, Change pass the a law or an, or an amendment, and that may take too many years for, uh, and again, justice delayed is justice denied, so I... I do think we need something that could be done other than the years that the amendment process takes. Yeah, that's okay. good. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting good point. Thanks for the call. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I agree, though, that justice delayed is justice denied, because, I mean, part of the whole reason why we have the court process is to try to make sure that innocent people don't get hung because the mob wants to see some blood. Well, a quicker process in that, is the fourth branch of government, which is the people, right? And the jury. If, if I mean, it doesn't to, matter exactly. what the Supreme Court says. It doesn't matter what Congress says. It doesn't matter what the president says. If you can have a what Frank Turdy always no. tells us about the fully informed jury, they were actually the branch that could say, "No, we don't care what." One, one more point on, law on the Supreme Court before we go back to the phones here, and that is, uh, you know, for those who who like to hold up, you know, well, if the Supreme Court said it, and it must be so. I mean, the first instance, we that's the reason why abortion is considered legal across the entire nation is because of a, a Supreme Court ruling in 1973, and people act as if because the Supreme Court ruled, then therefore it must be so, and we must guarantee it and keep it that way forever. Does anyone remember what happened in 1854 with the Supreme Court? The I... Dred Scott decision? You know what that did? The Dred, what, did that, what did the Dred Scott decision do, David? Well, yeah, the, the Dred Scott decision said, no, uh, you're not free. Somebody owns you. Yeah, it, it upheld you left. slavery. Right, and that's that's funny because people talk about, well, slavery couldn't have ended without the government, but it was actually the government the that government held the, were perpetuating. Held the in, yeah. institution up. It was the jury that actually rendered... Um, those laws, the the slavery laws, basically moot. They there was like eighty percent nullification of uh, of rulings that slaves had to go back to their masters, and so that undermined the law to such an extent that that people didn't even believe that it was a legitimate law anymore. Exactly. And so that was a lot more effective than I mean, like this caller pointed out, it takes a long time to change this via the the processes or whatever. But with the jury, you know, it can happen quickly. And the other problem that we're talking about is the laws. Like with the Supreme Court, what we're talking about there is political law. So if we go back to our founding of the document of the Constitution or whatever, that was supposed to be held under common law, natural rights law. It had nothing to do with political law. So basically, if Congress passes something, the Supreme Court upholds it and it violates your Rights. Let's go back to the Ninth Amendment to the Constitution. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So just because they pass a law, if it violates your rights, it's political law, and it doesn't count, basically. You're not held, you're not liable. I mean, sure, you can get thrown in jail or whatever, but you're not morally bound to follow that law at all. Are you? I, I don't think that you are. If it's not law, and what is political law is that thing that we, uh, what we have every day. You see that over there at the uh, the, the borough, borough building. Mm-hmm. They pass a law, they repeal a law. They pass a law, they repeal a law. We talked about the other day on your show. It's not logical to say that something is law if you can keep repealing it and passing it and repealing it and passing it. Then it's bunk. It's garbage. It's just a man's opinion. You do not have to follow those laws. Everyone, listen to that. You do not have to obey political law. It doesn't have anything to do with common law. Common law is the one where we have your natural rights. You have to follow your natural rights where you f- do everything that you say you will and you won't egress on another man's rights or property. No. Uh, those are the only laws you have to live by. Everything else is a political law. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says. It doesn't matter what the Const- 
it doesn't matter what the Constitution says or how they interpret it. It's not law. You're not obligated sounds, or bound under the Constitution to follow it. That, that, that way you just put it, that sounds suspiciously like the golden rule, Josh, that idea that somehow that you would do unto others what you would have them it was, do unto you. It is the golden rule. Passed down by ages and ages of... Are you some kind of a religious zealot? Philosophy and thinking combined by a whole bunch of different religions that all say the same thing. Do what you say you will do and don't egress on other people. We'll be right back on Patriot's Lament right here on KFAR. Balanced. All right, welcome back to Patriot's Lament right here on uh, KFAR. Good morning. These boys are sucking down some coffee today. Oh, we've, uh, wow. Working on that Republican purge. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 458-TALK is the number. Shall we go back to the phone? Yeah, I'm done. All right. right. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Randy. Randy, good morning. Yeah, diff- different hour, different show. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, the uh, presidential poll primary is coming up, and there's four good people running. And, uh, of course, uh, Ron Paul is an excellent person, probably got the best ideas on the domestic scene and I really like those ideas. But? Now, I might be voting for somebody else. On okay. That, but, but? There you go. Okay. You know, everyone, they say, you know, has quite trouble with him or something or questions with him on the foreign thing. And I wanted to uh, talk about that subject, about the foreign thing, and, um, and specifically about what the Constitution says about the United States being able to take military action way far away from our shores in some area that doesn't even uh, involve us. And, for instance, as an example, let's say some separate country like Cuba was going to try to take over another little country like Grenada, for instance. Is there anything in the Constitution that would bar the United States from uh, defending Grenada? And and, and I ask that after looking at the Constitution in uh, Article 1, Section 8, which is the part having to do with the, with what the Congress can do. It says here, in, that, in the pertinent area, it says the, the Congress can to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations, to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water, to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years, to provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections and repel invasions, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them uh, as so, may be employed in yeah, the service. So, so okay. this gets in, you know, you talked about the law of nations. Um, so when is it okay to invade another so-called sovereign nation? Like, who's, who's law of nations? It's like, well, you know, defend, you know, Granada against... Uh, Cuba. Okay, terrific. How about um, attacking um, Iraq or attacking um, Afghanistan, right? If if you're the, the law of nations uh, thing is really cute, but it only works if you apply it completely asymmetrically. Because if you applied it symmetrically, then no nation would ever be able to go to war with another nation. Well, my question is in this hypothetical example of whether or not it's right for us to defend Grenada or not. That's not the issue. I don't see anything in the Constitution that prevents us. From going to war and uh, and defending Grenada. In other words, that's what worries me about Ron Paul. If uh, if uh, North Korea attacks South Korea, would he stand by? Maybe not necessarily land and uh, hold divisions on uh, South Korean soil to, to 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 stop the North Koreans. But would he supply over uh, reconnaissance flights? Would he help our military? He's, he's addressed take this. Pictures, um, he's addressed this before. What, what what's his answer? If he's held by treaty, he has to. If, Right. If war is declared by the Congress and uh-huh. it's deemed necessary, um, he's okay with that. Okay, that's good. Now, so th- this is where Republicans don't like him. Well, we like all our wars that aren't declared. Do you know when the last war that was declared uh, was in this country, Randy? Well, Iraq. Nope. No. The, can well, you name the last the war that was declared in this country? I- Iraq. No. no. Yes. It no, was not it was declared. not declared. Well, what was the last war? The... Randy, no. Yeah. We're not yes. going to do this. Yes. Nope, we're not going to do this, yes, Randy. Yes, I am going to do it. Here's B- why. Be quiet. No, I'm okay, not... can you mute him, Steve? I'm, I'm, he's muted. Go ahead. <laughs> what was the last war that Congress declared? Actual now, you, declaration you, you can put, of war. You can put Randy on, and he can choose to answer the question or avoid it. Well, if you want to, okay. Okay, cut him is... back off. He's not going to answer the question. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, you can hang up on it if you, if you want. All right, bye-bye, Randy. The last war that was declared was World War II. Yep. 
Congress has not declared war since then. If That's you authorize because, military because action. Because people, under, people in this country understand that war is going to cost them a lot of money and that their young kids are going to go die, right? And, you know, how many of these Republican congressmen or senators or whatever uh, are going over and participating in the war themselves? I think they should be the first to go if, if they're going to send other people's kids. But they, they know they can't get a declaration from the people because the people understand the cost. And... But they love their war. They love killing foreigners. Let's find out how we can use the Constitution to justify killing people we've never met. And we had you know, World War II lasted how long? Three years. Yeah. They right. They declared and, war, went and, over and, and kicked their butt, and came back. Or maybe four, four years, whatever, that we were involved in it, three and a half. So we went over, we fought, we got done, we came home. Well, I guess we didn't but, quite come home. but Yeah, we still have troops in both Japan and Germany. And Germany. Sorry. Yeah. But regardless, regardless, his his position is if the Congress declares war, if they authorize, if they have a declaration of war that they authorize, um, he would, you know, he would consider that based on the... Uh, the global situation, which is but that's, considered which, an authorization from the people, right? Which is which is a total non-issue today because all the countries and all the wars that are going on now that the U.S. is in are undeclared. There hasn't been a declared war in this country in over 70 years. You see, and actually, uh, Randy uh, answered his own question when he asked what in the Constitution prevents the declaration those, of those, war. Those, that, that 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 issue, and that was when he just read it that uh, the Congress shall give you know make provisions to call forth the militia to defend against invasion. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. There's another little provision in the Constitution that says specifically that the government shall not have any powers except what are specifically declared. Therefore, if it is not specifically declared that you can call forth a militia to go and defend another country, then the government does not have that power. How about if you take uh, for folks out there that are Bible readers? I'm going to go down this road for a minute. If you're reading the Bible and you, uh, Randy, I think he does. If you're reading the Bible, do you take, um, when you're reading it, do you actually think about what was the intent of this writer? If you don't take the intent of the writer of a book of the Bible, you're going to just make up your own religion, basically, because you're going to go, well, I don't really care about what the intent. I'll pick and choose what I have, what I decide I want it to say or want it to be. So when you read the Constitution, Randy, you should go back and look at the intent of the writers. And what did the intent of the writers was over and over, stay out of foreign affairs, stay out of foreign countries, stay out of obligating yourself to protect other countries, stay out of their affairs. Washington said it, Madison said it, Jefferson said it, Franklin said it. Okay, so these guys wrote it, signed it. What was that, What was their intent? Stay out of foreign war. So if we're going to follow intent, which you have to do, otherwise you, you have something that means nothing. You have the Constitution of No Authority. You have to follow intent, and the intent was leave other people alone. Take care of your own problems. And we don't do that, so this is why we have all these other wars that are not declared, and we tell each other, well, where is it in the Constitution? Where we, it's not in the Constitution that you can go do that. The intent was leave people alone, trade freely with other countries, be friendly to everyone, and make this country rich. In doing so, but shall we go back to the phones? Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? All right. How about this line? Good morning. Good morning, Frank Turney here. Good morning, Frank. It's already been said, but uh, you know the jury is the ultimate decision maker. Whether it comes, the laws come or passed by Congress or your own state legislature. Just remember this: you cannot be punished for your verdict. So when you go into that jury room, you have a vote to vote your conscience and judge the law as well as the facts of controversy. Uh, regarding Ron Paul, he's the only candidate that I know is worthy of protecting individual liberties, and he's the only candidate to stand up and repeal one of the most dangerous bills ever passed by Congress, and thanks to Begich and Mikrowski, and that's the uh, National Defense Authorization Act. Section 1021 and 1022, indefinite detention. Can you imagine that on American soil? If you're charged with a crime, you could be locked up at Denver. You, no, you, you, you don't even have to be charged. No jury trial. Frank, you don't even have to be charged. It says that they can be detained even without charges. On suspicion of. On suspicion, suspicion of. Charge. You don't even have to be charged. Exactly. Domestic belligerent. 
Yeah, Isn't did, that fine? Have you seen, I don't know, if, Frank, if you saw the uh, debate where they actually asked something about the National Defense Authorization Act, and they asked the four candidates what their thoughts were, and they were all fine with it. All oh, yeah. uh, You had uh, Romney, Santorum, and the Grinch were all completely fine with it. Of course, they said, well, I wouldn't abuse my power. I want the power there to abuse, but I wouldn't abuse it. Right. Uh, Ron is not- Paul's the only one that said, absolutely not. This needs to be repealed. And he turned around and looked all three of them in the eye, and he said, this is what separates us. I don't want the power. I don't even want it. Right. Get rid of it. So all you people that are thinking, well, the lesser of two evils, just how evil is the lesser of two? If they're going to support something that gets rid of the Bill of Rights, and they have the authorization and the quote-unquote right it goes back. to pick you yeah. up and take you wherever they want with no, right. no just, not even a charge, right? You not even a charge. Not even to be charged. I would like to say, don't be surprised if you see me in a prison garb with a sign to stop NDAA. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. At Westmark. All right, and you're, say, Frank, one more quick question for you before we let you go. Uh, we, earlier we were talking about the choice of the lesser of two evils. If you had to choose in an election between Hitler and Stalin, I mean, they're both evil, but one's lesser than the other. Which would you choose? Neither one of them. Right on. All right, thanks for the call. Thank 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hey, this is Jim. Jim, go ahead. Hey, I was wondering, uh, during your uh, commercial breaks or whatever, are you guys able to listen to the news that you're playing? Unfortunately. Or is that something you have to catch later? No, we... uh we do. We can listen to it. It's just depressing. So we yeah, we're kind of subject to it. it. <laughs> well, Go ahead. I was thinking, uh, at the top of the hour at nine at the nine o'clock hour, uh, if you get a chance, you might want to listen to that. Uh, they were covering a speech that Ron Paul was making down in Washington State for their caucus down there, and I was kind of alarmed to hear him say that uh, uh, in his speech he said that there's really not there's really the, the all the Republican candidates are very close and that all of them are good candidates, and he said that the main thing is to get a Republican to replace Obama. And I'm thinking, well, that's not what I was thinking he was standing for. I, don't, I thought he was more separate from the rest of the candidates, and I don't know if I just heard that sound bite wrong or if they just picked a little piece of it. And I was wondering if you guys would be able to, to check on that and see, uh, see if you could get the whole speech and see what he actually said. Yeah, I hope. I hope that's misinterpreted because in the past what we've heard him say is that he wouldn't support any of them the way they are right now. I mean, he flat out said, I would not support. And he might even say that he thinks, I mean, maybe he was just saying that he thinks the three of them up there might be a little bit better than um, Obama. But in the past, I mean, recent past, within the last week, he's or two weeks maybe, he said that he would not support any of the Republican candidates if they were the nominee. And that's what I thought. I thought that's what his position was. So now I'm wondering if he's starting maybe to jockey for a position in one of the administrations of whoever gets elected. I think he said he's, he would refuse that if, if yeah, he got he that. Yeah, he did. He's actually well, been asked that point blank, and he said no. He, okay, I don't cool. think that he's uh, – I mean, I think it was uh, – I can't remember – what governor it was, but they asked him about a Romney-Paul thing, and he said the last person in the world that's going to make a deal is Ron Paul. I mean, the last 30 years he hasn't. I don't really see him trying to appease. Oh, that's cool. Cool. Well, just if you get a chance, if you can, if you can check on that at the 9 o'clock and just see if I heard it wrong or, or if it was missing, if they, you know, if they just pick their little sound bites and they just tweak whatever they want. But if you guys get a chance to listen to that later on, it was on the 9 o'clock news. It was about a speech he was giving down in Washington. Yeah, I'm sure the whole speech will be up uh, as soon as he's done. You know, it's it it's interesting. Uh, Ron Paul was not in Washington today. Ah. So wonder. I'm yeah I'm not I'm not maybe I'm I'm not saying that you misheard, uh, but I'm looking at a story right now about uh, the polling in Washington. Uh, it shows that all of the candidates except for Ron Paul were campaigning in Washington. Well, and like I said, I may have misheard it or misinterpreted what they said. So that's just the way I took it when I heard what I heard on the radio. So, you know, if you guys get a chance, check on it, see what you see what you think about it. All right, yeah. thanks for the call. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Hello, that me? It might be. Depends on who it is. Hey, this is Bud. Bud, it is you. Congratulations. What's on your mind? I'll tell you what the deal is. That gentleman called in that said the federal government killed Joe Vogler, okay? There's a few of us in this town, and I'm one of them. 
uh, that knows for a fact that Joe Vogler never was killed by the government. We know for a fact it was Cartoon Fred, Fred West, okay? One of the people that solved this case, uh, that really put the case together, was was on the inside, and his family had to be protected, okay? So it didn't really come out. He was on his way to prison. It was a lot of work done, <clears throat> a lot of tough work done to put that case together. The body, everybody, there had been over 150 of these people in this Forest Service been questioned, okay? And I'm going to tell you what, they were the most misleading people that you'd ever come to, all right, or come across. When you got done talking to them, they created a lot of doubt. There was a lot of the Forest Service would have been in it. Lynette Clark, on this radio station right here, got it started and kept it going, okay? The fact of it is, Joe Vogler was killed by Fred West in the most stupidest, idiotic deal that you could ever have happen, okay? It was a freak when Joe got killed that night, okay? The fact of it is, Cartoon Fred knows knows the facts. There's a couple, three that know the facts, four or five. And it was one of the toughest, most miserable cases to put together. What I want to say, Joe Vogler was never killed by the, by, by the government. Thanks. If there's any of you have got any facts and proof that the government killed Joe Vogler, there's, there's a few of us like to know. The guy is still alive, that solved the case, that worked inside. His family had to be protected. He was on his way to prison. He did go to prison. But from being on the inside, the work that he did for Jim McCann, the rest of the investigators, to put the case together was a phenomenal case, okay? All right, brother. Appreciate the call. Thank you very much. We're going to have to move on here. We're running out of time. Good morning, caller. Who's this? You still there? Hello. Is that hey, me? It might be. Who is this? Yeah, this is John. John, go ahead. Yeah, I was listening a while ago when Randy came on, and uh, he was talking about uh, um, the declared war and everything else, and I, I believe I heard the same thing somewhat yesterday. But uh, I was kind of interested. I get tired of hearing Randy occasionally i think we all do somewhat <laughs> but at the same time he has quite a bit of information and he uh <clears throat> he came on and and uh you know it, it struck me uh i i uh i like to listen to this program i like to listen to these the radical radio but for you guys to pull the plug on him i wanted him to be able to explain what he was talking a little enlightenment give him a few more minutes on you pulled the plug on when you're talking when you asked was when was the last declared war and then Randy said World War Two. No, 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 no. Randy said Iraq. Or Randy. And then said I Iraq said, no, that's it's not Iraq. Iraq. You get to try again. And then he ref- he did not want to answer the question. Well, Randy on he, average gets more than five minutes on this show when he calls in every time. I know. I and know. And so I know, so, so there just it just has to be there has to be a throttling. Plug on him, which means I wanted to get the enlightenment and or find out what he had to say, which I don't. I believe you guys are probably right on this one. Still, I wanted to hear what he had to say i don't like the idea of uh people getting too carried away and eating up all the time but i also don't like the idea of you pushing the button on them and you you know i'm beginning to think from the sounds of it that you all might be a little bit more democratic than you're saying more democrats here or something because democrats are great for sticking their head in the sand and not listening talking over people and not allowing them to express their opinion so are Republicans. Well, he's he's had plenty of opportunity, and he's welcome to call back next week. But he did already call in once today. It's, earlier. It, just we, we try to keep it to the facts. I mean, there's a lot of well, yeah, our perception of the facts. There's a lot of wandering calls, and uh, some of those, some of Randy's calls can wander, and some of them go in a great direction, and some of them don't. But if right. he's if he's going to call in and talk about war, where does the where does the Constitution say we can't do this? Bam, declaration of war. What was the last declared war? Simple question. If you're going to avoid that question, there's no point in the call. The call has already gone off the rails. You've thrown out the Constitution, which was the original intent of the call. And so if we're going to keep it, if somebody's going to call in about a specific issue and then they're going to jump from that issue, um, we don't have time to go through all that on this show. That's something, you know, and I, I, if I'm sitting down talking to somebody about something specific and they keep jumping all around, that's not even worth my time because we can't focus on the topic. Well, that's true, but I would like to have heard as his explanation of how uh, to understand how he sees that that was the declared war. I'm sure he was probably going to come up with something I, along the lines of, of Congress authorized it. 
I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that Randy will call back to enlighten you on Monday. All right. Good deal. Thanks, Thanks for the call. Sir. Thanks. Right. 458 Talk Thanks. is the number. Say again. Uh, Let's see the hotline. The hotline it is. Good morning, caller. They didn't hold. Let's go to the next line. Good morning. Who's this? Yeah, this is Don. Don, go ahead. Yeah, uh, two things. One, again, like you were doing your analogy between Stalin and Hitler. Yeah. Look at the, uh, which is the worst evils, the, a dictator in England or a dictator or 3,000 dictators nearby. <laughs> yeah. Good, good point. Are, are you saying that basically uh, we we traded the King of England for the uh, the King of Congress? Well, that's what it sounds like. What it is the? I think the quote was, "Well, I change one dictator three thousand miles away for three thousand dictators in my backyard." Mm-hmm. Or something. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's what we have. Appreciate the phone call. Thank you very and much. It, and yep. then the second thing too is okay when people talk about militia and stuff like that. It's interesting how. The National Guard has taken over the things of the citizen soldier and, you know, part being part of the militia and all that stuff. But then on the other side is, you know, they, they work basically for the federal government since they are, you know, they get all their equipment and everything else and go fight foreign wars with it. Yep. Good point. So, Thanks for the call. I'm off. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Lisa. Lisa, what's on your mind today? Uh, we are fighting enemy combatants and not any country. And um, th- this is the Democrats' best friend show. That's why you guys demagogue. You don't believe in freedom of speech, but you believe in myth-making and your false utopia religion. And how, do you, wait, how, do you, how do you know day. that? Lisa, how do you know that? Oh, she just uh, called in to snipe and leave. How do you, how does she, that's, that's great. How does she know that, that, um, that we want, that, that, that we're the Democrats' best friend? How do, I mean, how, did, how does she know that we belong to a utopian religion? Is have have we ever said that? Have I we don't ever know. I mean, I don't um, I don't participate in the political system that she does, so I don't even know why she cares what I think. If if that political system is the effective one, and I choose not to participate in it, I don't even know why anybody would and care. Well, these think. enemy combatants are in specific quote unquote sovereign countries, aren't they? That we're in. Well, I mean, if 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 you flipped it around, Josh, and somebody <sighs> came into our country trying to take some of our citizens because they called them enemy combatants in some war that we as a country were not aware of, and people started abducting Americans, would we not be just a little pissed off? Maybe just a little tiny well, bit? Well, the Americans, probably not. If, I mean, if you're, fighting, um, if you're fighting specific enemy combatants, which was the, the premise of that, why do, you, um, why do you bomb an entire city? Why do you bomb Baghdad if you're fighting... Specific enemy combatants because why, you, because what, you might hit them. Why do you bomb Kabul if you're fighting specific enemy combatants? For the same reason that we bombed Hiroshima. <laughs> right. Yeah, you take enemy out eighty thousand in a couple seconds. You're probably going to get a couple bad guys. You know, I you know what I think I I think I thought of why uh, Dave she might be so threatened by the fact by by what you say even though you don't participate in her political system. Because if more people along with be, began to think the way that you did and began to refrain from the political system and stopped giving the different political parties, whether it's the Democrats or the Republicans, the power over them by becoming a part of their party, then they wouldn't have the power. Well, actually, it's, it's the reverse. I mean, I think that um, her and, and other people have expressed a concern that, uh, you know, the, the party needs a purge to get people like – like me out of it, but I'm, I don't participate in it. Like, I'm already out. It's cool. You guys can have your thing. I'm okay with that. Um, have fun. And if that's effective and I'm not part of it, then don't worry about what I'm saying or doing. But now you've got people like Josh Bennett here who are going into the party on uh, on Tuesday in order to part- in, in order to participate in the system, in order to get this one particular candidate that yeah, that's, you want. I'm okay with that. I'm actually okay with that. I'm okay with Randy voting for Santorum. I'm okay with you not voting. I'm okay with everybody doing whatever they want. I'm okay with that. I'm not going to try and talk somebody out of being a Republican or voting or anything like that, because then I'm just trying to force my values. I'm trying to overlay my values and tell them they're right or wrong. And they can they can make that decision themselves. What? I am complete right. I'm okay with that. That's fine with me. You believe in um, freedom of conscience? What? <laughs> right. So <laughs> you call yourself so an if American. somebody you know, there's a lot of people out there listening, and there's a lot of people going to go see Ron Paul. I think Ron Paul's a great guy. I myself am not going to vote for him because I don't participate in that anymore. If somebody wants to, 
and they have the right reasons in their mind, and it, it makes them feel like they're making a difference, and it's the most effective thing they think they can do, then that is absolutely the right thing for them to do. And more power to them. Um, I myself won't be doing that, but I'm okay with other people doing that. Or, or other people voting for Santorum or Gingrich or whatever. It's, it's on their conscience what they do. I can't control what they do anyway, so I'm not going to get hung up with their actions. Sure you can. You could pass a law. <laughs> but I, No, that's still not me controlling their actions. That's me kicking the can and telling a cop to do something that he may or may not want to do. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Yeah, I've been listening to your station for quite a while now, and Lisa definitely sounds like the type wearing a uh, tinfoil hat in her basement <laughs> protects herself from heart rays, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyways, you know, uh, it was a couple weeks ago. You guys were uh, kind of on the uh, society would reach the point where we didn't need a government. We'd realize we're all free. Uh, there would be no war. Uh, basically, uh, you know, essentially a utopian state. But, no, uh, no, we actually didn't go all the way down those those roads. You might have connected some dots that we didn't lay out. I think we actually outlined that there will always be bad people. And the question is, how do you deal with that? Do you create a institution that the bad people can take over, or do you devolve decision-making authority to the individual as much as possible? That was what we were proposing. Not that not that man, the nature of man would change. Okay, well, then maybe I misunderstood you. I was just to the point where, I mean, things like uh, radical Islam, do you honestly believe that that religion will ever reach the point where the rest of the world doesn't need to be protected from it? Uh, you're you're talking about Islam as as an entity, but it's it's a belief system. So you'd have to talk about individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're asking, can the world will the world ever not need to be protected by from bad people, right? Because there are people who believe in Islam who don't kill anybody, and there are people who believe in Christianity who kill a lot of people. And so we have to talk about the individual, not these abstract groups, which right. don't actually exist. All all that exists are people either using force against other people or people not using force against other and people. And just uh, just as a point of order here, if you look at historically speaking, uh, going back to 1802, what was it, 1802, when Pre- uh, President Jefferson sent troops to respond to the Barbary pirates, those were Muslim extremists who were attacking Americans back over 200 years ago. Somehow, after we kicked their butt, then, until 2001... We didn't have the the need to be protected from them. Yeah, Why not? Well, it was it was a group of people. I mean, to to throw a blanket religion on it is, is out of time. Talk radio for the interior. Six sixty a.m. K F A R Fairbanks.